Whoa, okay, so ETFs have become super popular in the last few years. Since 2003, the money invested in ETFs has gone up by 3000%. That led Michael Burry to call this a 2008-like bubble. Burry is the hedge fund manager that was featured in the movie The Big Shot. He's the one who predicted the housing crash right before the 2008 global financial crisis. And a few weeks ago, Kathy Wood, the founder and CEO of ARK Invest, made similar statements about index tracking ETFs. Hearing that from such smart and successful investors is scary. But why do they think that we are in an ETF bubble? Are they right? And what are the risks for you? These are the questions that we will look at in this video, so let's get it. What's up everyone, this is FU Academy, your channel for financial education. And on this channel, I share lifestyle, investing style and educational videos just like this one. So if you are new here, consider subscribing. Let's quickly go through the basics. ETF stands for Exchange Traded Fund. It makes more sense if you read it backwards. It's a fund that is traded on the stock exchange. It has an objective which can be to track an index like the S&P 500. So instead of going out and buying all of the companies in the S&P 500, you can simply buy an ETF that tracks the S&P 500 and that way you own a small portion of all of them. If you want to know more about ETFs, then please check out the video in the link. Let's look at the first ETF bubble theory which comes from Barry. And that has to do with price discovery. He says that passive investing removed price discovery from the equity markets. Now let's unpack this. What is price discovery? Price discovery is the act of determining the price of a stock, for example, by looking at all factors such as supply and demand. It essentially means that the buyer analyzed the stock and knows the fair value of it. Then buyer and seller meet, negotiate a fair price, and complete the transaction. But index-based ETFs don't do that. Their only objective is to track an index like the S&P 500. So the ETF provider goes out and buys all the stocks that are included in the S&P 500. The ETF doesn't care if a stock is over or undervalued. The money flows from ETF buyer to the companies that are included in an ETF and increases their share prices. If you want to know why and how that happens, then please check out the video in the link. And as long as it's buy, buy, buy for ETFs, then the share price of companies that are in that ETF goes up, up, up. And Barry sees a big risk here. He says that without any price discovery, market forces will come in at one point and correct the prices through a stock market crash. Let's take a look at the first ETF bubble theory. Is it true that there is no price discovery anymore? In 2017, Jack Bogle, the father of index investing, made a really interesting point about that. Bogle was the founder of Vanguard and introduced the first index fund in the 70s. He said that the stock market would still have price discovery even if indexing would be 90% of total investing. Also important to understand is that it's not just investment flow that sets the share price. It's more so the trading activity. So the last transaction that was done on a certain share. If you want to know more about how a stock price is calculated, then please check out the video in the link. But how much of the trading activity comes from index investing? According to a Vanguard research paper from 2018, indexing only had a share of 5% of total trading activity in the US. So not really big. And even if ETFs did inflate the prices of certain stocks artificially, there would be smart, active investors that would take advantage of this. They would invest in undervalued and short overvalued stocks until the price goes back to a normal level. And if you think that this channel is undervalued, then please make sure you subscribe. The second ETF bubble theory also comes from Barry and that has to do with liquidity risk. Liquidity means how easy it is to convert assets into cash without affecting the market price. Barry says that more and more money flows into index-based ETFs and therefore into a limited number of companies. But when these inflows start turning into outflows, it will be ugly, he says. Barry describes it as a theater that keeps getting more crowded, but the exit door stays the same. And once there is panic, everyone will run for that same exit door. 
Let's unpack this. What he means is that when there is an event like a market crash and ETF investors want to get out of the stock market all at once, there won't be enough room for everyone to get out without massively taking down the share price of the companies that the ETF is invested in. And this liquidity risk is higher for smaller companies in an ETF because not a lot of people buy or sell these stocks in a normal day. Now imagine a scenario where there is panic in the market and everyone is selling their ETFs and therefore also the stocks of these tiny companies. Because there is no one that buys or sells these stocks, it could bring down the share price massively. We are about halfway through. If you're getting value in this video, then let me know by hitting that like button. Thank you so much. Let's have a look at the second ETF bubble theory. Barry is right that liquidity for smaller companies is lower, but is it true that a lot of ETF money is flowing into smaller companies? Let's take a look at BlackRock's S&P 500 ETF. The S&P 500 index is weighted by market cap and so is the ETF. So the bigger a company is, the higher its share in the index will be. Let's take a look at the share of the 10 biggest companies in that ETF. It's 29%. So 29% of the ETF money flows into these 10 companies. Now let's have a look at the 100 smallest companies in this ETF. It's 2%. So only 2% of the ETF money flows into the 100 smallest companies. And here's the thing. Some ETFs won't even bother buying the smallest companies because it's not worth the time or transaction fee. Instead, many ETFs do sampling. They buy the biggest companies and adjust the weights in a way that it still tracks the index. That's why the smallest companies sometimes don't even get any ETF money. Another point, Barry makes the bold assumption that all ETF holders would run to the exit door and sell their ETFs in a market crash. But ETF investors are usually buy and hold investors. So it's really hard to imagine that they would all sell everything at once. But question to you, do you hold ETFs and would you sell them in a market crash or would you hold on to them long term? Let me know in the comment section below. And ETF bubble theory number three comes from Kathy Wood and that has to do with misallocation of money. She's gotten super popular in the last few months with her actively managed ARK ETFs. And she said a few weeks ago that index-based ETF investing is contributing to the most massive misallocation of capital in history. In her view, the S&P 500 is loaded with companies that look cheap but she calls them value traps. A value trap is when a stock price looks cheap, but the business is so weak that the share price will continue to fall in the future. Wood says that these companies will be left behind because of innovation and disruption. She said that the money will start rotating from these old companies to disruptive companies. And when this happens, the ETFs that track an index will suffer the most because they are backward looking. So they look at the past success of companies instead of looking into the future. That's why index-based ETFs invest money in the wrong places. Let's take a look at the third ETF bubble theory. Is it true that index-based ETFs are just throwing money at old companies? No. They track the performance of thousands of companies within an index. If there are industries that perform good, then their share in the ETF will increase over time. And that's exactly what happened here over the years. If you look at the 10 most valuable companies in the S&P 500 in 2009 and compare them with the top 10 a decade later, it looks completely different. Only Microsoft and Johnson & Johnson could stay in the top 10. The others were overtaken by big tech. And is it true that index-based ETFs have no exposure to innovation and technology? Again, no. Look at the market share of tech companies in the S&P 500. It's 40% at the moment. Tech could double its market share since 2014. And that's the beauty of an index-based ETF. If a sector performs good, the companies in that sector will become more valuable. When that happens, their share in an index will also increase. So if you invest in an index-based ETF, you don't need to worry about betting on certain industries. The ETF will take care of this for you. If you still want to know if you should invest in a tech-based Nasdaq ETF, then please check out the video in the link. So there you have it, three theories why we could be in an ETF bubble. And these theories are removal of price discovery, liquidity risk, 
and misallocation of money. The theory that passive ETF investing is causing a bubble is old. They often come from active fund managers like Barry or Wood. At the end of the day, both of them are also salespeople for their actively managed fund. History has shown that investing in the stock market through an index-based ETF has been the most successful strategy. And it comes with some benefits like diversification, low costs, and transparency. And asking the question if there is an ETF bubble is essentially like asking the question if the stock market is in a bubble. But what do you actually think? Will Barry be right with his prediction that the ETF bubble will pop and bring down the stock market? Will Wood be right that money will rotate out of index-based ETFs into innovation? Or will the ETF and the stock market just continue to go up? Let me know in the comment section below. So I hope that this video could help you to understand if we are in an ETF bubble. This is actually one of my first videos. So if you want to support this channel, then please make sure you subscribe. Thank you very much for doing that and peace.